Well, and if Al, if you want to start with introductions, uh, we can always, we'll get to Zach and Manny last. Yeah, that's not a problem. You know, and you know, when we get started here now, I just I want to welcome everybody to our question and answers forum today, our panel discussion about RecPon and, and kind of going over the, the three episodes that Julie videoed and put together that really explain the project when it began, uh, some of the monitoring that we've been doing, and then also how you are all involved and can be involved in this project. Uh, before I get, even get started, I want to thank the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, who is on the Zoom meeting. Uh, they could jump on the panel if they want, it's up to them, who funded this entire project. And also, uh, Atlantic Coast Habitat, uh, Fish Habitat Restoration Partnership, uh, they, they also helped fund this uh, to put in the surprise video we have for you today. So be ready for that. We're not just going to have the three episodes where we just highlight what, what we've done and then kind of answer and field some questions for that. But we have a surprise episode that Julie just put together this morning. So it might be a little rough, but from what we saw, we thought it looked really good. So for those of you that don't know us, and I'm, I'm guessing most of you do, we are the American Little Society. We care for the coast and we empower others to care for that coast. And we do that pretty much through our restoration and conservation activities. We do it through education and we also do it through advocacy. So we're out there every day working to protect the environment and keep it going. My name is Captain Al Majeski. I'm the Habitat Restoration Program Director for the American Little Society. And I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. We have Hillary, our development director, say hi. Hi everybody. Um, my name is Hilary Cortelli. I'm the Director of Development Membership and Outreach for the Literal Society. Um, I'm going to be monitoring the chat and the Q&A. Uh, so please, again, type any questions, anything um, you need into either of those places, and we will do our best to address everything um, at varying points during the presentation. Great. And, oh, and I'm supposed to say next. So. Next is Julie. Hi everyone, I'm Julie Schumacher, Habitat Restoration Technician for the American Literal Society. Um, I was actually the intern for the society back in 2014 when I was a student in Stockton. Um, and for some reason they've kept me on this whole time. So uh, <laughs> I'm pumped that uh, Rec Pond is uh, one of the key projects I've had the pleasure to work on and be involved with. I'm happy to see so many familiar people on here um, and to get new people involved. That's the exciting part about this webinar and kind of moving forward with our um, our programs at Rec Pond is uh, the more the merrier. We want, we want people involved and, and experiencing um, what we get to experience every day in the field. So thanks for, for joining. Uh, and I'm Zach. Royal. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Habitat Restoration Coordinator with the American Little Society. I am here. I brought Manny down, so by request, see if you can see. There he is. There's our staff morale officer. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, I hope you guys enjoy this webinar. We're all here excited to tell you about Rec Pond, and um, I say let's get it started. Yeah, sure. So what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll do a, a lead in here real quick. So I'm going to introduce Rec Pond, the first episode that uh, was created uh, that you've probably have seen, but we have some highlights that we put together just to kind of refresh you a little bit. It talks more about the Rec Pond restoration. Um, we've been out there pretty much since 2006. So this is our 14th year of doing work in Rec Pond. I just want people to remember that uh, we were out there when they extended the, the, the original outfall 300 feet to see what the alewife and the blueback, if they were coming through that pipe or not. And what we did see was they were not coming as much. So that kind of prompted the fact in, uh, I think it was 2014 or 13, uh, the county came in through the state and funded us to keep, continue monitoring. And then US Fish and Wildlife came in and after Hurricane Sandy and funded us to build a secondary box culvert that you see out there today. Um, so that's what this video is gonna be about pretty much. And Hillary, you can hit it. And afterwards, we'll field some questions from you guys. We'll just give it a second to fix itself. There we go. There you go.
Situated along the Jersey Shore between Spring Lake and Seagirt Borough is Rec Pond, a 73-acre tidally influenced coastal pond within the 12-square-mile Rec Pond Brook watershed. Fed by three main tributaries, Rec Pond drains the water from four neighboring townships directly to the Atlantic Ocean. Due to an increase in development, increased stormwater runoff, and the restriction of Rec Pond's once natural inlet, Rec Pond has been conflicted with decreasing water quality, frequent flooding, and a decrease in migrating fish species' ability to access fresh water. In 2013, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service was awarded a Coastal Resiliency Grant to reestablish fish passage for diadromous fish species between the Atlantic Ocean and Rec Pond. U.S. Fish and Wildlife partnered with the American Littoral Society, the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, Spring Lake Borough, and several other partners to address these issues. Between 2015 and 2016, a five and a half foot by eight foot by 600 foot long fish passage box culvert was installed between Rec Pond and the Atlantic Ocean to increase fish passage, reduce flooding, and improve water quality. Because Rec Pond's inlet was closed off, underground pipes or culverts are necessary to allow water to continue flowing between the two separated water bodies. Not only does this fish passage box culvert act as a secondary connection between Rec Pond and the Atlantic Ocean, it was designed specifically to address a certain water depth, water volume, water velocity, and even appropriate ambient sunlight to create optimal conditions for migrating fish species. So there you are. There's some highlights <clears throat> from, the, from the first video. Um, I think this project we completed in December of 2016, if I'm correct. Um, Zach had actually started at the American Little Society while this project was going on, and, um, and Julie was here already, but in the, uh, the education department, so I'm glad that she's part of the restoration team and helping out there now. Um, <clears throat> so far, the only thing that we've seen different is the velocity. So though that's a little bit of a a hard job to me measure the velocity of that. We feel that we've done a very beneficial thing for the river herring because we feel they're riding the tide in and not expending that energy that they would need to actually swim against the current. So that's been pretty beneficial for them. And, um, and Zach's gonna touch on some of the other results on fish abundance and presence uh, after episode two. But at this time, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> again, um, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to type them in. <clears throat> and I will say it was a, <clears throat> excuse me again, I will say this, um, as part of this project, we originally thought that it was going to cost much, much more than it did. And our, um, our subcontractor who came in, Simpson and Brown, they bid about half that price uh, for the building of this, um, or, or doing this restoration. And because of that, we were able to use the remaining funding to continue the monitoring that we're doing today. So thanks to that, that they came in and they did a, a great job. Some of the, the pictures that don't show are the ice, the flooding that happened, the storms that we went through. Uh, so it was a, a relatively lengthy process. I want to say, Zach and Julie, it was about maybe five to six months to construct overall, you know, yeah. with stuff like that. You know? um, so we do have some questions coming in now. Um, hey, we've got Captain Paul in here. Hey, man, how are you? Good to see you. Uh, he wanted to know what's the distance between the daylighting grates. So, um, Zach, you can answer that a little bit. I'll, I'll start. They're about 100 to 150 feet. Yep. They're large tubes that have a manhole, and we've pre we prepare that manhole on top so we don't have any um, falling in of birds, you know, like the piping plover. So that grating's been adjusted. And they're painted on the inside with a white epoxy, pretty much, uh, that allows that light to kind of come in and we get enough diffused light to keep that, the, the photosensitivity of those herring, you know, um, under, under arm. So. Can you talk about what, um, what does that mean? Uh, what are daylighting grates, just for those of us who aren't familiar with that term? Sure. So, I mean, for better terminology, daylighting would be open the whole thing up. So originally that would, that way you have the sun coming in. So daylighting allows sun, sunlight to come in. 
Um, when we first went to do this and when Fish and Wildlife was writing the proposal for, to the government to get the funding to do this work, we wanted to keep Rec Pond open. Because you might not remember, but during Hurricane Sandy, Rec Pond was open again. It's the first time since 1930s that it was open to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, but it was too costly to do that. Um, so that's when we, we settled on this next, the, the, the one that's out there now. And that has every 100 to 150 feet, like I said, a, a tube that allows light to come in that's called daylighting and kind of opens it up a little more uh, to sensitive species to light. Um, I'm going through this. You might, Hillary, you might want to get in pretty lengthy here. Let me see what I got. <laughs> sure. Here, let me just read off to you where we are. Um, okay. So how often is the water tested and how often are the test results published? That's a good question. So we don't monitor the water quality. We do through some of our citizen scientists on the interior. The water quality at Rec Pond is monitored by NJDEP. And I believe, <clears throat> Julie and Zach, they have a monitor on the outside as well as one inside somewhere. And I don't know when that data is published, but I want to say it's probably published either quarterly, monthly, or whenever they take it, but it's, it's pretty in situ. So they're doing that work year round. Okay, and then um, is the monitoring of an, and let me, I might mispronounce this word, anadromous species tied into the state's anadromous fish management plan? So we let the state know exactly what we're getting. As part of our collections permit, we have to go ahead and give them a report each year. And, and Zach and Julie and myself, we prepare a report uh, for the spring sampling and the fall sampling. We provide that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and to the DEP. So it is passed on to them. I don't know exactly, if, we're not really giving them any recommendations of the management of that species, but we're providing to them that this is working and we're seeing more and more alewife come through and we're, we're still waiting for those blueback to come back. So who knows, you know. And then um, Captain Paul wants to know, on, is uh, it only open during the spring migration? Yep. <laughs> we want to open it more um, and we're working on that. Uh, originally, they were gonna, we were going to have it open a lot more um, to kind of see what transpired. We have two antenna set, which Zach's going to talk about later, uh, to yeah. monitor, see which fish passage is being used the most. Is it the old culvert, the 800 footer? or this 600 foot one. Um, but yes, it's open for spring migration for the adults to come in and then it's closed during the summer right now. Um, but the young of year are still getting out through the original outfall. All right, so this one is a little long, so bear with me. Um, Richard says he'd like to see the invasive uh, plant species removed from the shoreline in Spring Lake Heights. Please provide open spaces for recreation purposes um, we show the Spring Lake portion of Rec Pond, but not the hidden Spring Lake height portion. Um, and he wants us to comment on what can be done to open up Rec Pond so that everybody in all the communities around it uh, can enjoy the beauty and the resources uh, of the pond. Wow, great. You know, I feel like I owe you five bucks on that one. <clears throat> we have a surprise video for you about Spring Lake Heights and what the work we just recently accomplished. That's going to be shown at the end of the third episode after our Q&A. Um, so I'm not going to tell you anything yet. I'm going to let you be surprised, okay? But uh, I think you will be. Also, when it comes to invasives and things like that, we are now working. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has allowed us to use some of our funding to help along the shorelines. And Zach, is, Zach and Julie and myself have met with Seagirt, uh, so far, and at Edgemere Park, as well as their terraces, to start removing invasive species and helping them along. So it's just a matter of time getting up to Spring Lake. We, we understand there's invasives there, and we'd like to open that up and make it more natural. Great. And then has the fish population increased since the completion of the project? Is Zach going to address that? Yeah, I've, so I'll be talking a little bit about monitoring, and I'll go into that in the next section. Right. Um, let me see. And we've got a couple questions in the Q and A. Um, Joe wants to know: Are these uh, YouTube videos that he can share um, with the HRFA newsletter email blast? And 
Uh, I believe the answer is yes. You can um, get the full videos. So each snippet you're going to see is a, a small portion of a longer five to six minute video. Um, there are three, soon to be four, uh, that are all available on the Literal Society's <laughs> YouTube channel. Um, so you can go to YouTube and just search American Literal Society and you'll see them all available there. Right, and I, I also see here in the chat that Brian Nealon's on from NJDEP, so he's the anatomist fish guy. Uh, so if you have some questions, we can probably field through him on the chat as well uh, on the species. Thanks, Brian, for being here. And I know that Danielle is on here from U.S. Fish and Wildlife and perhaps some others. If you're, if you're out there, um, just type in the chat here and, chat and introduce yourself so everybody knows you. Appreciate it. I think for this, I'm going to pass it over to Zach if we don't have any other questions right now. And we're gonna get into our episode two highlights and Zach's gonna introduce that and then he'll be ready to, he has a little bit of a, some data afterwards to share with you of what he's seen. So I think it'll be very informative. Zach, take it away. Uh, yeah, so as Captain Al said, I'm gonna be talking about our monitoring work that we do, some of our monitoring, monitoring work that we do at Rec Pond. So we've got a little video to show you that gives you just a general overview of the different things that we're doing. And then I'll talk a little bit about the results. So Hillary, you can cue that up. Again, that's a really handsome guy in that first one. Yeah. <laughs> The American Literal Society's role at Rec Pond has been to document and monitor fish species presence and abundance pre and post construction. The Society's species of concern are alewife and blueback river herring. River herring live out at sea but migrate each year to fresh water in order to spawn. Their numbers have dramatically decreased in recent decades due to a loss of spawning habitat, overfishing, and other inflicting issues. To monitor river herring in Rec Pond, the Society has conducted seasonal herring surveys. In the spring, when river herring adults are migrating into Rec Pond to spawn, Society staff members utilize a fike net set and monitored around lunar cycles to catch, tag, and release adults. Many other species are caught in the process. All fish are sampled, but only herring receive tags. The tags are called passive integrated transponders, or pit tags for short, and are installed into the fish's side, similar to how a pet dog or cat receives a microchip. Staff can then monitor their movement using antenna systems installed throughout the water body. We like to call it a fish easy pass. These antenna systems are currently run off marine batteries, but in the 2021 season, the Society will be converting these antenna systems fully to solar, saving time, energy, and electricity. In the fall, Society staff switch methods to monitor Young of the Year juvenile herring. A 100-foot per seine net is pulled near the culvert on both the Spring Lake and Seagrit sides. All fish that are caught are sampled and documented. Because of their size, the juvenile herring are not tagged. They are simply measured, counted, and batch weighed like the rest of the fish before being released. Great, fantastic. And I just have a few comments real quick, Zach, uh, mm -hmm. before you jump in. Yeah. How many, how many times do you think you changed it, the configuration of the antenna at the culvert? Oh, it's been multiple times. So uh, yeah, I can talk a little bit about that. One of the <laughs> issues that we have there with that, uh, that culvert antenna is the water velocity is so uh, strong there that it tends to get damaged. So we've gone through a lot of different iterations of that antenna, but I think we kind of got it down now. So it took a little trial and error. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I, I just wanted to say how proud I am of you guys from switching from the batteries to solar. And yeah. I, that's, we're still doing that work now, but it really shows that we're moving forward to have more of a self-sustainable kind of a monitoring strategy here using solar power to power those batteries and things like that. So yeah. So, so people oh, yeah, know. Just about the solar, one of the, I mean, I'll go into it a little bit. Um, with our sampling this year, it's, it hasn't been like previous years because of COVID. So we had some issues. We couldn't be out in the field. We couldn't use volunteers, et cetera. And one of the things um, that we started thinking about is we need to be out there monitoring herring. We have this pit tagging system that is set up. Uh, if we convert it to solar, 
it will previously, we have to be out there every week. We have to take those batteries, recharge them in the office. It's a lot of time that we're spending out there, back in the office, et cetera. By converting to solar, it's not only just better for the environment, but it's going to take time away where we don't have to be out in the field as much. We don't have to be interacting in the office. So it kind of worked out really great in that sense. So yeah, and it gives us, oh. gives us more time to focus on that surprise video coming up and you'll see. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, great. And I'm glad you touched on COVID because I, I think, you know, volunteers they, and, and people on this pre presentation want to know how have we adjusted at the American Little Society with our restoration and, and our monitoring programs. And we have adjusted, we've taken on more on ourselves. Uh, we can't involve volunteers right now. Um, we'd love to and understand volunteers are an extremely important part of all our restoration because when the community's involved and the volunteers are involved, they're a part of that restoration and they're engaged and that restoration then lives on through what they say, you know, from their stories. Yeah. Go ahead, Zach, I know you got more. I don't wanna be uh, showboating here. Yeah, no, 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 that's all right. So I think the, the video gives a really good overview of the monitoring that we're doing. And what I wanted to do is share some of the results, right? So we've been doing this for a number of years and we've learned some neat things about our river herring. So I've got a couple slides and I'm gonna try and share this with you guys. And while you're loading that up, I do wanna say thanks to Ray saying how young I look. All right. Yeah, I saw, I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be the lighting, Ray. It's got to be the lighting. All right, let's see. Okay. Um, so if you saw in that video, one of the first things that we do in the beginning of the year is we monitor in the spring for our adult river herring that are coming in to spawn. Uh, so at Rec Pond right now, we only get alewife in, as I think Captain Al mentioned, back in 2007, we did have um, some blueback that were coming in, but we haven't seen them since. So we, um, we get alewife, and we had a question earlier about have we seen an increase in the population since the culvert? So that's a really good question. It's a little difficult to answer it right away with the amount of data that we have, but what I will say is that it is trending upward. It's a, it's, we have a good sign that we may be seeing that. And you can see that in our graph here. So that goes from 2014 to 2019, and I have it split be before the culvert and after the culvert. Uh, and you can see we were kind of steady between 100 and under 150 before. And since, after the an initial low year in 2017, we've seen increasing numbers of alewife uh, each year. So unfortunately, like I said, we couldn't go out this past season in 2020, but we're hopeful starting again in 2021 that we'll be out there again and we'll continue to see increasing numbers. So um, besides just monitoring uh, their, the numbers that are coming in, we've also learned a number of other things about our river herring that are utilizing Rec Pond. So we know that they typically arrive between March to June, we will see them. However, it's really the sweet spot is mid-April to mid-May, that's when we get the bulk of them that come in. And generally, they arrive in these one to two large bursts or pulses, right? So we'll get a couple in the beginning of the season and a couple at the end of the season. But sometime in that mid-April to mid-May, we'll get over the course of maybe one to two to three days, we'll get the bulk that we wind up catching for that year. So they kind of move in these big pulses. So besides just alewife, we catch a whole number of other species out there. I'm not going to go through them all, but you have, I have it listed there. And I just kind of wanted to show some pictures of some of the more common ones or some of the more interesting ones. So that's our alewife that we catch. Um, but besides that, we also get gizzard shad um, throughout the year or throughout the spring. We catch uh, several large carp uh, each year and they seem to be getting bigger by the year. Um, white perch is pretty common that we see out there. We'll also see uh, your sunfish. So we get pumpkin seed, we get bluegill. Uh, white suckers are fairly common as well. And then occasionally we get uh, several large snapping turtles, which are not fun having to get out of the net. Uh, yeah, so well, I will say back in, back in 2007, we got a huge snapper in the fike net and yeah. we had a net to get it out. Yeah, I mean, it's always, it's always scary when you see them in there. Luckily, we don't get a lot and we'll get them towards the end of the season. It's kind of like the sign, all right, we're done. Um, 
And if you open it up, sometimes they'll make their way out. Sometimes you kind of got to give them a little hand. But uh, yeah, I think they're cool looking. I think they're really neat looking, but you know, a little scared. So what do you think is the, uh, the most unusual species you got there? And are you seeing a different trend in species abundance or diversity since the culvert has been placed? Uh, yes, yeah, so that's a really good question. So I guess unusual species, I think that's probably, I mean, that's, I guess that's up for debate what you find unusual, but um, we typically, I'm trying to think, I'm looking at the list. What did I see that's uh, kind of oh, Either from, is it from this you. or the fall sampling, you know, because I know. Yeah, I'll go into the fall sampling and we got a little, line. I got some pictures of some yeah. kind of interesting oh, ones. Great. Um, but at least for the spring sampling, what I can tell you is that we are, seeing it seems to be a shift to more um, marine species or more salt tolerant species up there. With the installation of the culvert, we do see uh, the tidal extent has moved back. So we are getting greater salinities at that railroad location where we sample. So we're starting to see some juvenile striped bass back there, which we didn't see earlier. And uh, a couple more that you would consider more like marine species or more or have a better salt tol tolerance. And I think uh, just one other question I have for you that might be good for everybody listening. Have you seen yes. any of the morphology of the creek change since like changes in current under the bridge and things like that? Since yeah, that's yeah, another good question. We do see um, a little bit at that location. So during those tides and those extreme tides, we're starting to see, um, we definitely see changes in tidal the height of the tide at those locations. So it's about a foot higher and a foot lower during the high and low tide. And then in those areas where it constricts, you get to see uh, a little bit more of a faster water velocity going through those areas as a result of that. Um, so let me continue on unless you want me to answer some questions here too. Um, some Q&A real quick. Um, yeah. Pillar wants to kind of read some of those off. If you want to read the one sure. how young I look again, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Captain Paul wants to know if the daylight grapes are only open during that spring migration season or if they're open all year round. So the daylight grapes are open all year, that are part of the culvert there, it's all year round. They're just essentially just open manholes that are attached to the culvert. So they're consistently open. We don't close them at all. Well, they're covered by a grate just so they Yeah, can... there's a grate that covers it, um, yeah. but they actual, there's nothing that's gonna like close them off, you know? Yeah. And so Diane asked, and I, I typed this into the chat, but I do wanna say it out loud for everybody that uh, the presentation is being recorded and will be available uh, in the next few days on the Literal Society's YouTube channel. Um, so be on the lookout for that if you would like to share this with anybody or um, know somebody who missed the presentation. Um, and then just a comment from Raymond, um, some of the carp have grown so large that the bald eagles no longer uh, go after them. So uh, that's good to note. That one looked pretty big to me. Yeah, we get some, that's a uh, like average to small compared to some of the other ones. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then, so a few other questions. Um, why has the population of swans in Rec Pond decreased so much? Will the increase in fish improve the number of swans using the pond? You know, I don't, I, it's so funny that this is a question because I talked to someone recently, uh, just the other day about the swans. Apparently they were way more numerous um, a couple of years ago. I wasn't working at the time at Rec Pond to see them. Um, so I don't, since I've been there, there's never been a huge swan population. So I'm not sure how this would have affected their abundance there. I don't know if Al, you have any ideas or Julie. Um, I don't know if. Uh, well, I know that they're, they're not fish swan. eaters. I'm not a yeah. swan expert, but I don't think the change in population of fish would do anything. Uh, they're, they're more of like a, for better choice of words, kind of a filter feeder, if I'm correct. Yeah. So, um, feeding on vegetation. Um, so maybe they're moving. Uh, we saw them up in Old Mill Pond, a bunch of them. Yeah. Recently, you know, so maybe they kind of moved. That's all. I don't know. I don't know the answer. Yeah, that's, a, I would say they shifted upward. I don't know how they deal with salt water as opposed to fresh water. I don't know if that would play a role. 
um, as it, if it got a little more salty where we where we've installed the culvert now and they might have shifted further on up. Um, again, I don't know a lot about swans. Yeah, I, I will I will mention this on top of that question. We have seen an increase in young of year herring coming back out, so that's yeah. pretty beneficial. And I and I want to just reiterate, which I haven't said it yet, um, in talking with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Rec Pond is a model for all these other fish passage projects and. We are the only ones that I know of right now continuing this long-term monitoring with the pit tagging and the seining and the fall, you know, the fall and spring in the Northeast region. So we have a lot of good data that we've been collecting to show its success and how do we adaptively manage that restoration too. So we're learning as we're going. Great. Um, and then Robert wants to know, um, it looks like there was a big drop in American eel before and after. Any thoughts as to why? Yeah, I mean, that's something that we've noticed in this work and I, we've kind of thought about. Um, I don't know if it's related to the culvert. I, we have had, um, at, at that time, we changed our fike net. Um, it's built to the same, the new one is built to the same specifications, although it's, there are a little bit of things that are different. I don't know if they're able to wriggle out of this new one a little easier. Uh, as Captain Al talked about as well, uh, or kind of alluded to with the question, the morphology it, of um, that area underneath the bridge has changed a bit, whereas before it was easier to completely block off the entire railroad section. Now with the the kind of faster water flows that go through there and the higher and lower tide, it's a little more difficult to completely block off the area. If you guys saw in the video, that fike net is essentially just a series of rings that are, that for, that are connected with uh, a netting. And then there are two wings that go out and it funnels all the fish into that netting area. So if those wings are, if there are gaps in those wings or things like that, fish can swim through them or underneath them, et cetera, like that. So it is a little more difficult to kind of block off that section now. So I don't know if there's just more gaps there that our, that our eels are real slippery, able to get out. Uh, it's something that we've all noticed and uh, that I've tried to kind of come up with ideas on why it may be. And it's something that we can investigate going further. Great. Any winter flounder in the fike and or seine net? No winter flounder in the fight, but definitely in the seine net. So if I can go ahead, I'll talk a little bit. I got to talk real quickly. I'll talk about our pit tagging and then I'll get into the seine net and then I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the fish that we catch in the, in the seine. So that's essentially our fight netting. I will let you know if you guys are interested in this type of work or volunteering. Again, we're hopeful that in the next year we can start having volunteers out. Uh, again, we'll have to see how things go. Uh, but if you email me, uh, we'll have, my email is zach at literalsociety.org. I'm sure we'll post it somewhere. It's on our website. I manage the volunteers who come out. So you send me an email, I put you on a list. And then when the time comes, I wind up emailing you the dates that we actually go out there. So we always use volunteers. And if you'd like to come out, just shoot me an email. And then when the time comes, I can get in touch with you. So moving on, let's see if I there we go. Okay, so as part of that spring sampling, we incorporated pit tagging in 2016. And really the idea behind this is we wanted to get a little more information on air life behavior in the watershed. So we knew they were coming into Rec Pond. Besides that, we didn't really know much about what was happening. So as you saw in the video, those pit tags are these little electronic tags. I think you can probably see my mouse. Those are as an example right there. And we implant them in the alewife that we catch. And then we set up antennas. These are all the locations of our antennas throughout the watershed. And when a fish swims by the antenna, it registers the tag number on computers that we have set out. So in this way, we're able to track where our fish are moving in the watershed, and it records the time and the date as well. So we've tagged over 450 alewife since we started this program. And like I said, initially, we kind of just wanted to know where they were going. Uh, how far up the watershed they were going, which tributary they were utilizing. So what we found is that they make their way up pretty much all the way up Rec Pond Brook. We get tons of hits at Route 71 and we get a good majority of our hits 
of our fish going all the way up to Rec Pond Brook, where they essentially can't go further because of the old mill dam. Um, so after, so we learned that, and then through this program, we've also learned some other things about our pale life, right? So they spend about a month in the watershed after we capture them at the, here's the railroad bridge right here, in case you guys wanted to know. So after we capture them at the railroad bridge, they spend about a month in the watershed. Uh, there seems to be a slight difference in the sexes with males spending a little more time than females. Um, but both are around a month. They are active primarily at night. So anywhere from dusk to dawn is where they're more active. Uh, we do get repeat spawners. So they have a measure of spawning site fidelity, which just means that they come back to the same spot each year to spawn. So every year we typically catch a number that we had tagged in previous years. They are utilizing the new culvert. So we have data that's showing that they're going back uh, out through that new culvert when it is open. Uh, but one of the things that uh, moving forward as we expand this program, we do want to get more detailed information about their culvert use. So it's why we implemented this other antenna that's actually in the culvert uh, and kind of how what Captain Al talked about. We want to know um, how they're moving in relation to the tide. So are they riding that tide in or riding it out? Uh, what time of the day they're, they're utilizing the culvert, et cetera. That would be important information for other uh, tidal systems to kind of get some idea of how they move in these with the tides. And then we'll also be expanding this up the watershed as we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so that's some of the pit tagging that we do. And again, we're continuing this program as we go on. And then we seine. So um, in the springtime, we are capturing the adults that are coming in to spawn. And then later on in the year, we want to see, is their, has their spawning been successful? Are we now seeing young of year alewife that are emigrating back out to the ocean? So we do SANE surveys. We use a 100-foot SANE net with a bag that's attached. We sample at, near the culvert. So we have two sample locations there. We pull, uh, a, we pull the SANE on the Spring Lake side and once on the Seagirt side. And we uh, identify, measure, and weigh uh, a subsample if there's a lot of fish or all the fish that we catch. So our results. Again, we are targeting our young of year alewife. And the results haven't been as great with the adults. So typically, if you can kind of see from here, typically we catch only a handful of young of year each year. And there's a number of reasons why. So just like our adults, it seems that our young of year emigrate in these pulses, right? So a couple of them will move maybe throughout the season, but the majority of them are gonna move from their upstream habitat where they were born out to the ocean in waves, in one or two large waves. If we don't catch those waves when they're coming out, we're not gonna catch the majority of these fish. And it's just hard to time when we're gonna catch them because there's a number of factors that could be influencing when they actually emigrate. From precipitation to moon phase, prey availability, there may be some innate behavioral things with them that where there's early migrants versus late migrants. So there's all these factors that people don't really know uh, that are exactly going to trigger when they're going to move down or out back to the ocean. So it's hard for us to time when we get there. However, we have gotten good results before. So in 2018, we caught almost 140 in one day. And so that's where it seems that we caught that pulse. And that was in July. So originally when we did this sampling, we would only start in the fall. We thought based on the stuff that we read that they were, they were emigrating out in the fall. And then through some uh, just random sampling that we did, we started seeing them earlier. And now we sample, start sampling all the way in June. And uh, like I showed there, why I have that July circle, that's where we got the, the huge run in 2018. And then most recently, this year, we were able to start some seining again with just staff. And I know this year we caught at least 40 to 50 again in July. So going forward, it seems like July is the time where we really got to focus our efforts here and maybe catch when they're, when they're all coming out. So but very positive results. Yeah. So those are two, those are our young of year right there. 
uh, just some pictures of them. And then besides young of year ale life, we also get a whole ton of other species. So we typically catch, it's a little more diverse, the stuff that we catch here. Uh, and I'll show some examples. So we, we've started getting some more bluefish in there. Uh, we catch some seahorses occasionally. That's a striped killifish. They're fairly common that we catch. Uh, Atlantic needlefish, those are all also uh, pretty neat. And we're starting to see maybe a couple more of those that we're catching. Puffers, people always love catching uh, northern puffers. They're kind of fun. Uh, pipefish, kind of unique. Um, uh, we do catch flounder. That's kind of a bad picture. I believe that's summer flounder. It's hard to tell, but we get summer flounder here. We get winter flounder, and then we get some more rare species. We get window pane, and we've even got uh, smallmouth flounder before. Uh, and and spot tail flounder. And yeah, so we get some uh, a number of flounder species. Um, Menhaden will catch every once in a while, a big uh, school of Menhaden. That is a juvenile weak fish that we caught back in 2017, which is a rare one. That's the first time we'd seen that in there. Uh, we have a short guy. Uh, so look at that thing. Uh, we caught that once. Um, <laughs> yeah, something that we did not expect to see in Rec Pond. Um, and then we've even caught a juvenile mahi mahi before. So some of the kind of, we had that question, like what's the most unusual, strange thing? Uh, the mahi mahi was pretty strange. That big eye was pretty strange. Something that we didn't expect. So that's our, um, our SANE surveys. Uh, that's kind of, let me go back to just me. Uh, so that's kind of an overview of our monitoring besides just the fish work. We do other stuff that complements it. So we do habitat um, surveys where both me and Julie walk up, we survey the quality of the habitat throughout the watershed. Uh, we do, as part of that, we do some macroinvertebrate surveys, again, where we're trying to assess the different quality of the different tributaries or areas of the stream. Uh, and then we do some other water velocity monitoring and, and things like that. But that's essentially yeah. an overview of our monitoring. And I think that was, that was great, Zach. Thank you so much. And it's a great yeah. way into what the volunteers can do for us too with the Citizen Science Program, which Julie's now gonna talk about. So yeah. we, we do have a ton of questions. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, questions. I'll take All some. Right. Yeah. Um, well, so, and there are a few uh, that I'll run through, but um, so is there a disadvantage to keeping the culvert open more frequently than the current schedule in place? Yeah, so the issue with the culvert, like we said, we want to have it open as much as possible. Uh, the issue for why it is closed is because there is a concern about bacteria that will flow out of the culvert, particularly during heavy storms. So the DEP monitors that. And in our discussion with them is they, they currently don't have enough manpower to sample frequently enough to kind of make the case to open it more. So something that Julie may talk about in our citizen scientists and where we want to expand this program is to kind of um, use our resources to help collect that data that maybe they can't and then kind of make the case to hopefully we can have this open more than closed. So that's the big reason why it's closed uh, during the times that it is now, particularly during uh, beach season, you, you won't see it open. So. Okay, and then um, we noticed a large decrease uh, from say 2015 to 2016 with certain species, banded killfish, white perch, for example, any reason for that? Uh, in 2015 to 2016, um, I don't know, it could just be some natural variability. That would be before we actually did the, the culvert was installed in the end of 16. So all that would have been before that. So that could just be variability in either temperature, or maybe how we were sampling, like things like that. I don't think it would be it wouldn't be related to our to our work necessarily. I will say that, I don't know if I touched on it, we are seeing a little bit of a change in fish assemblage, it appears to be at the sampling post restoration. So again, more of those um, marine species, we are, we are catching more common, like Atlantic silver sides, we catch tons of now. The killifish, the mummy chugs, sheep's head minnow seem to have moved a little further uh, upstream. Okay, so we have a couple of questions, both in the chat and um, in the Q&A, about 
um, interconnectivity of upper waters versus lower water, um, installing a fish ladder at the mill dam. So you all um, get another $5 from Captain Al, but we will not answer those questions at this moment because yeah. uh, you'll see uh, a little bit about that um, in, a in a few minutes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so then just moving into the rest of the questions here, why is the North Branch not monitored? The corner of ocean and shore would seem to be a good choke point to monitor. Uh, so I think you're referring to Black Creek. Black Creek, yeah. Black Creek. So we have done some work in Black Creek. I didn't include it in there. Um, in the past, we had some anecdotal reports that maybe herring were going, moving up into Black Creek. So we took a season and we set up a separate fight net in Black Creek. Uh, and we did not uh, catch any uh, alewife. And turtles. We, we, we caught pretty much primarily just <laughs> freshwater species, uh, lots of snapping turtles. Uh, so we don't really think they are going up there. There is a weir there that prevents mm -hmm. most species from going up. So you only have access during these extreme tides uh, that fish may be able to get over. Uh, so we don't think they're utilizing it based on some of the sampling that we did. And also based on our habitat quality, uh, our habitat assessments, it, Black Creek has poor habitat quality, particularly for, for river herring. It's relatively shallow. Um, throughout a good portion of the time, there's relatively low DO. So we don't think they're really utilizing that area based on some of that stuff and the previous monitoring that we did. Great. Is sediment from the vegetation overgrowth a factor in fish population? Uh, sediment from the vegetation overgrowth? Uh, I'm just reading the question. <laughs> no, uh, I don't think that's really... Um, and I mean, if you have a situation where you have a buildup of sediment that increases turbidity in an area, that could be a potential, uh, that could affect fish in a way. Um, but that sediment is more from runoff that you get from erosion upstream rather than related to vegetation. So maybe vegetation could trap some of that, but the main cause of that would be erosion upstream that is then flowing down. So within Rec Pond or within that watershed, there are actually a series of ponds that kind of act as sediment sinks. So it gets kind of trapped in those little pond areas and it can build up there. Um, but yeah, it wouldn't necessarily be related to the vegetation so much other than the vegetation could potentially trap some of that sediment as, it, as it's moving. Great. Do you ever transfer any alewife into the lake above the dam in hope to create a landlocked population? Well, again, this is something that... Video four. Yeah, stay <laughs> tuned to the end of this. All right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then uh, this spring, there were several days of hundreds of fish jumping in Rec Pond. Were they alewife spawning? Um, I, it's hard to tell. I don't know if they, if they necessarily were. We weren't, um, we weren't sampling this spring be, because of COVID restrictions, so we weren't out there. Um, we do get, uh, we do get predatory fish, yeah. like, um, you know, like blues in there that, um, typically you'll see them chasing schools of fish. Exactly. Um, so it could we'll get, very well just be a school we'll of bunkers. smaller fish being chased by a larger fish. Yeah, we get, we get bunkers common. or the Menhaden in there, so. Right. Again, stuff. stuff. Okay. And then what's the salinity at our same site? The salinity is, is pretty much um, at that, it's pretty much marine. So it would be like 30 around there, right? 30? Yeah. yeah, it doesn't really go below. I think the lowest is like 25. So it's 35 to 20 at lowest. Yeah, mm -hmm. at, the, at the railroad bridge, it does vary based on the tide. So we'll get it. Uh, we can get, I mean, as low as like one or below, and then as high as I think we've seen. I want to say fifteen there, but maybe a yeah. Little, yeah, it gets it can, more around like five. Yeah, those eight. like yeah, the blowout or yeah. um, those nor'easters will blow salt water in and yeah. Okay, and then this is the last one because uh, we're running up on time, and That's as right. long as everybody on the panel will stay on, we'll record the rest of it. If you folks have to jump off. 
um, feel free to email questions um, into us. We'll make sure to get all the questions back answered out to you. So one last before we move on to Julie, is there evidence uh, that increased tidal velocity flows are scouring sediment out of the pond? Um, I don't know. Yeah. You can go ahead, Dal. Yeah, I mean, we haven't seen any evidence of scouring yeah. from this. We have seen, I mean, still, even by the culvert where it's at, it's relatively shallow and there's a sand shoal there. And I know that's been dredged quite a few times. So sand is still depositing uh, coming through but we haven't seen much of a change in any sedimentation at all that, that noticeable to the eye, to put it yeah. that way. Okay, let's have Julie get going then. Do it, Julie. Uh, all right, uh, Hillary's gonna start again another, um, just a quick recap or review of episode three for those of you who haven't seen it or just need to be reminded and then I'll talk uh, a little more detail about our volunteer efforts. And then the surprise video. Yeah. <laughs> Stay with us. Stay with us. This video will act as a virtual training to become a true steward of Rec Pond through the Rec Pond Citizen Science Monitoring Program. The Rec Pond Citizen Science Program is a volunteer based program where community members individually conduct water and bird monitoring surveys throughout the water body. There are six locations throughout the watershed where volunteers can conduct these surveys. There is a communal supply box that contains all the equipment needed to conduct these surveys. Water monitoring surveys consist of documenting water level, salinity, and temperature. Equipment that you'll need are the volunteer badge, a water monitoring data sheet and clipboard, a refractometer, and a digital thermometer. When you reach the water's edge, place your items on the ground and begin by locating your monitoring site's water gauge. The gauge reads from zero to four feet. A refractometer measures the amount of salt in the water or salinity that is present. Go down to the water's edge, collect a sample of water in your pipette, lift the plastic cover on the refractometer, and place just enough water on the screen to cover the surface. Close the plastic lid slowly to get a good sample secured and look through the eyepiece. It helps to face the sun. After recording that on your data sheet, grab your digital thermometer. Turn the power on and make sure it's set to Fahrenheit, not Celsius. Place the sensor in the water and wait for the thermometer to settle on the temperature. Record your reading and then hold down on the power button to turn it off. The final step in a water monitoring survey is to record general site observations. As a Rec Pond citizen scientist, you can also conduct bird surveys. Necessary equipment includes a bird monitoring data sheet, bird guides for the area you will be monitoring if you need them, and a set of binoculars. Simply pick a spot, observe bird action, reference your bird guides if needed, record your data, and repeat. Once your water, bird, or both surveys are complete, return all items to the supply box, place your completed data sheet in the return folder, and sign out. So I have, I have one all question. Right. How, how did right. you adjust the citizen science program during COVID? Oh yeah, I will, I'll definitely touch on that. Um, but since um, we've mentioned before that involving the community is, is crucial to any restoration project that we do, um, we always want to have volunteers involved and empower them with the work that we do. Um, so not only do we have this citizen science monitoring program, but we do a lot of outreach to schools in the area. Um, I've had over uh, about four years, so an entire high school generation um, has come to Rec Pond and, and done you know, field surveys with us and it's their annual field trip. Uh, we go to schools and do in-class lessons. So that's just an added um, outreach component that we do for Rec Pond. Uh, the Citizen Science Monitoring Program began just as we were about a month before the culvert opened in 2016. We created the handbook, 
um, to go over how we were going to engage um, community members and have them collect data that would help back up our data and get them involved. Um, to date, we've trained over 60 people um, ranging in all ages. I think our youngest has been, even with our fish sampling, you know, we'll get six-year-olds, five-year-olds coming out. Um, and then we have retirees and veterans. So it's a very inclusive, um, you know, different sites have different um, shorelines. So it's, it's very accessible for all involved. And it's been really fun to meet so many different people and have them uh, work together, you know, to collect this data. Um, we've had six students get um, enrolled into the National Honor Society through volunteering with this program. So it's a great way for uh, recent graduates or high school students or anyone who's interested in this field to get volunteer hours um, or just experience in the field. When it comes to scheduling this program, um, I've, you know, we're kind of grassroots, so we try something and if it works, we kind of stick with it. So I've used uh, Google Docs and I pretty much just have everyone's email who's interested in volunteering. Um, I've had some seasons where I've had 12 people and I've had some seasons where I've had 60 and it's made it, you know, every season is different with how many people um, we want to get out into the field. You do this individually, so it's not, um, you don't get grouped with anyone. You could do it with your own family, um, but for the most part, you're scheduled on, you know, on your own accord and you go and do the sampling by yourself, um, not with other volunteers. Uh, so I set up this Google Doc and basically um, I will assign anywhere from 10 to 12 people for a two week span. And I just asked during that two weeks that you sample twice. Um, so it doesn't matter what day, what time, it actually helps add uh, ver you know, variety in when people are going to the pond. Um, so some people can only go in the evening, some can go in the, in the morning um, due to work schedules or school. So it's really open to you as a volunteer. Um, but I just give you a two week span to say, hey, if you can monitor site two and site four twice during that two week span, uh, that's kind of how scheduling has worked so far. And I try to get um, everyone out, um, you know, at least once a month you're, you're scheduled um, for that two week span. And you're more than welcome to do more than two. Uh, I just ask, you know, that's, um, we're just happy to have help in general. Um, for the supply box, it's located right by the Black Creek Weir. Um, so that's mentioned in the video. Um, and there's a lock on it that has a code. Um, so if and when you become a volunteer, I will just uh, provide you with that information on how to access the box itself. And it's pretty straightforward. Um, you unlock the box, you collect whatever um, equipment that you need. You sign in, sign out, return everything, and lock it up and leave it how you found it. Um, it's pretty um, understandable. For the data, as I mentioned, with water monitoring, so where the three parameters we're looking at are temperature, salinity, and water, uh, water depth at these different locations. Um, and we don't just want, it's, it's great to have people experience uh, volunteering, but to have their data matter and have us analyze it has actually been very beneficial at Rec Pond. So we're not just having people, it's not just feel good um, or, or a learning experience and the data actually is very important. Um, so something that Zach mentioned is that we have seen a steady increase in salinity further into the water body. And we've only known that due to citizen science data at all these, the only two places we check uh, water parameters are at the fike net and at, um, at the ocean by the culvert. Um, so those are our only two areas, but due to citizen science locations, we have all these in between locations where people are collecting this data and through our two locations and then the, all the different locations, the citizen scientists are, are collecting salinity we have seen that steady increase, which does, you know, lead us to believe there has been a increase in tidal flushing and flow since the installation of the culvert. Mm -hmm. um, helps to know temperature at different times and different areas so we can understand migration patterns better. So again, having all those different locations um, throughout the water body where citizen scientists are collecting their data, um, we can better time those runs. So if we can affiliate a certain temperature or time of year uh, with these migration, as you mentioned, bursts, both with adults and with juveniles, 
um, having that data in all these locations will help us better time those bursts, hopefully. Um, and then tidal variation, there is no information telling us when low tide is at the fike net. Um, it's where we know Belmar high tide or Belmar low tide, and it's very, very different in the water body and in the watershed itself. So with them on site and collecting all these parameters as well as um, recording when high tides and low tides are, we can look back and see, wow, you know, Belmar said high tide was at um, 2 p.m. and it's not, you know, high by the fike net until 5 p.m. or, you know, we've seen pretty drastic changes. So that's helped us again with timing, when we put our nets in, when we show up to catch juveniles. Um, so again, the data is absolutely crucial and helpful um, to back up and help us do our jobs better. Um, and it, it verifies the other stuff that we do, Julie, too. So, you know, I want to thank uh, DEP and Monmouth University for providing us YSIs to do water quality, uh, to kind of QA, QC, for better choice of words, some of the work that our volunteer citizen science or community scientists are doing. Um, it's been really helpful. We also have Monmouth University does um, tide level every two years. We're doing habitat assessments and checking that post restoration and base before every two years. Uh, so we have a lot of monitoring going on, a lot of volunteer opportunities moving forward. So it's a great program that um, we actually shared our handbook with the state when they were creating, I guess they're called the, the light keepers or some citizen science stuff or some living shorelines they were doing down in Southern by Brigantine. So it's been a very good program. Yeah, it's been exciting and it, it changes, you know, over time and we have certain people have done it every year. We get new people each year. It's, it's been really rewarding. And we, we want to grow it too, you know, we, we don't just want, you know, we never want to see any stagnant nature and we want people to continue to be engaged and learn new things in the field, push us to learn new things in the water body. Um, so to come, you know, there's uh, different parameters we can, we can include, such as testing turbidity. Um, and then as Zach mentioned, um, water sampling sent to labs. So to help uh, maybe justify us opening the culvert for longer periods, if, um, the department doesn't have the capability or the resources to have people testing water frequently. Um, there's been other nonprofits that run uh, programs where volunteers send in water samples to labs and it helps uh, understand the, yeah. the water quality throughout all kinds of uh, periods of time and not and just we quarterly. With some things too. With not it's just something we, we've been talking to the state about and we would love to incorporate um, in the new season. And then back to sampling, we have volunteers who do um, the citizen science, and then they also do fike netting or, um, you know, the same net with us, um, doing battery checks and equipment checks. And potentially, uh, we'd like to install some uh, cameras um, that maybe we could live stream, such as at something that will be mentioned in the fourth video. Um, but something that citizen scientists, if you can't access the field, or for whatever reason, you could watch these videos and maybe record uh, seeing fish moving through uh, different areas and underwater cameras. So we're trying to, um, especially during this uh, changing time, um, how we engage the community um, safely. Um, and that's where COVID uh, can be brought up again. Again, I mentioned this is an individual uh, program, which is great because we can get volunteers out but there'll certainly be um, a more stringent uh, protocol to make sure everyone's safe and we don't have multiple volunteers showing up at the same time because that can happen in the old form of formatting. Um, so we will absolutely include uh, hand sanitizer and we ask people, you know, obey or <laughs> follow all of the, um, you know, the state protocols for COVID with masks and and hand washing and everything. And then we will periodically be cleaning everything in the supply box. And if you're using the supply box and you use a certain refractometer and a certain, a certain um, thermometer at the end, you know, wipe those down, we'll have wipes. So it'll be a very, and then we'll make sure with scheduling, it'll be more, you know, are you available Mondays and Tuesdays? And then the next person, maybe Wednesdays and Thursdays. So we don't have overlapping people at the site at once. And that'll just take a little more coordinating and communication between myself and whoever is volunteering. So um, that is something that we can get people back into the field doing soon. 
as long as people are comfortable doing it and, and following the, the guidelines, um, we're excited to be able to have some involvement again with, with our community and those involved. Um, and that kind of wraps up citizen science. We hope, um, again, it's for all ages, as long as you can access the pond, um, you can volunteer. Um, so if you know other people or uh, you yourself are interested, um, all our information will be shared in our emails and we'll be happy to get that involved. And I, I'll talk more with you in detail the video is a virtual training, so we won't have to meet in, in person, but we can talk more through emails about the fine details of scheduling and protocols and um, things like that. So Great. we hope to be on board. So uh, are you guys ready to see the surprise? Well, I have one question okay. first. All right. Um, I'm really excited about it, so. <laughs> Um, well, I am too, and I hope everybody uh, who has stuck around and ma the majority of folks have stuck around, so it'll be worth it. Um, but one quick question, Julie, do we coordinate with Monmouth University Coastal Lake Monitoring? No? We, we have talked Not to them. Had, um, we haven't talked to them, but we should. It's a great, great way. I do talk to college students often, and we had, um, just before COVID happened, we had a Monmouth University intern. I think through U.S. Fish and Wildlife was actually helping us at the pond. So we definitely, they've had involvement, uh, the, the college itself, with Rec Pond, and, and involving them would be a great way. Typically, for outreach, um, we try to engage high school and older or middle school and older um, just for the, the more in-depth science that we're doing. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty baseline, but it's still a little elevated uh, for the younger crew. And then um, with sampling and things, we love to include college students and having them involved. And it's certainly data that they could analyze themselves too for research or things like that. So that's a great, um, and, and I did. I did meet with Monmouth University last year about the, their observation program, um, and I think because of COVID, we just haven't really gotten together on it. But they know that we have a monitoring program that exists, and it'd be great to complement theirs. Great. Um, so Brian uh, and Al, I think you said he's from NJDEP, uh, said that students and recent grads, um, just as kind of a, a public service announcement, this type of volunteer work looks great on a resume when applying for hourly slash entry level full time positions with state and federal natural resources agencies. Um, and I think that's a great thing to note, um, especially at a time where it can be harder to get a job. Um, you know, getting involved with something like this is, is really great resume builder. Uh, while you might not be able to get other experience. So make sure and email Julie. Yeah. Be happy to write your letters of recommendation. And, and, you know, we've had many interns who hang out after their internship and continue volunteering with us and building hours. And um, it's a great community. And, and we're happy to have anyone who's interested. All right, Al, are you ready for the surprise? Hey. Surprise! <laughs> Here it comes, the answers to all your questions about interconnectivity. <laughs> <laughs> Hot off the presses this morning, yes. <laughs> How's it going, everyone? If you remember from part two, we hinted at an upcoming project on Old Mill Dam. Well, the American Literal Society is pleased to announce that over the last two weeks, we've installed our fish ladder. A fish ladder is a device that channels a stream of water through it that's deep enough for fish to swim in. Now that it is installed, Herring will reach the base of Old Mill Dam and finally have the capability to swim up the dam, through the fish ladder, and into Old Mill Pond and further into the watershed. With the improvement in accessible habitat, additional antenna stations will be installed to see and monitor just how far these amazing fish can go. Fish are able to swim up the fish ladder because of its design. You can see these V-shapes 
that actually slow down the flow of water inside the fish ladder, making the fish capable of swimming up it. It took a lot of teamwork and adaptive management once on site, but the team worked together and got the job done. We're so excited to see the installation and completion of this project, furthering our monitoring moving forward. With the culvert at Rec Pond and now this fish ladder on Old Mill Dam, we're excited to see continued improvements in this water body and hopefully an overall improvement in health in this ecosystem. Good job. <laughs> so I guess um, I can briefly touch on this. I know we've gone over our time here, but it is an Alaskan steep pass uh, fish ladder, straight straight run with the baffles in, that Julie talked about in the video. Uh, the, the design of it, the dam was actually perfectly angled to put that fish ladder on top. Zach and I and Julie looked at what kind of a, how, how, what the elevation you need at angle. And it's about 23% of a, a slope of that something, which is really interesting that it was it was right on target. Um, Atlantic Dock and Bulkhead uh, from Point Pleasant, they helped us out again. They've done reef work with us in the past and uh, put pilings in for Slade Dale where we did branch box breakwaters to restore marsh. So it was good to have our friends there again. Uh, they told us pretty much the day before doing it, they never installed a fish ladder before. <laughs> So we, we knew they could do it. So uh, we worked through that. And those guys are really good at, at putting together this fish ladder and installing it and working with uh, the adjacent Old Mill restaurant or Old Mill Inn, the owners there, and all talking together to communicate to get this ladder up. So um, we're, up, we're done installing the ladder. The next step is for us is to install some rock uh, to make kind of a, a diversion that the fish will guide, be guided into the fish ladder. That's going to be done in the next two weeks. And then we'll be done with that project. But we're glad we could share that with you, that big surprise. We're really proud of the fact that we've opened up another mile of river herring habitat. And from what Zach and Julie have done doing the habitat assessments uh, for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service have shown that the habitat does exist. Um, if you're familiar where Finns is on Route 35, all the way up into there, we've opened up just because of this fish ladder. Yeah. Julie, guys, I, uh, shout out Princeton Hydro. They did the yep, yep. design for us. So. Yep, they did. Great design. And we, we did experience some things due to COVID on this, which is interesting. Uh, no. we, didn't, we didn't have a, one of the brackets wasn't there. We were missing some hardware and things like that. So initially we would just contact the provider or you know the fabricator. Unfortunately, they went out of business due to COVID-19 as a manufacturer. So we had to do things more on the fly, a lot of adaptive management here, but luckily again, Captain Jim from Atlanta Dock, he was able to fabricate brackets for us. And these guys are really thinking on their toes uh, to make this a successful project. Now we just can't wait until next May to see fish actually go up 
Uh, the idea is if if we don't see them going up, then the next year we'll do a, a heave, uh, possibly, and get herring up and release them upstream and to see them if they come back. So that's kind of where we're at. We're going to put some antennas on there to track them if they're pit tag. And we're talking about doing, uh, Zach kind of talked about a little bit, uh, putting movie cameras in there or some kind of a camera. And then you could come log in on site and sample for us basically on site looking at going to this URL and it would be filming and you could see the fish coming up and you count them for us. They do similar stuff like that in Alaska. And um, we thought it'd be a cool way to involve people rather than you sit out on the fish ladder and count. So that's all I got guys. I don't got more to say probably. Um, so we do have um, a question here. Um, so just talking about more open spaces for recreation purposes, um, I'm just going to read this entire question and hopefully um, you guys can have some response to this. So um, would like to see the invasive plant species removed from the shoreline in Spring Lake Heights. Please provide some open spaces for recreation purposes. Rec Pond is a beautiful resource, but it is really hidden in Spring Lake Heights, and it should be open to use and not stay hidden. In our opening video, you show the Spring Lake portion and not the Spring Lake Heights hidden portion. Please comment on what can be done to open up Rec Pond so we can enjoy the beauty and water resources. Thank you. I think that kind of answers it all, <laughs> you know. Um, yes. Uh, invasive removal, we're looking at different areas in Rec Pond. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service is supporting us. Uh, like I, I mentioned, Edgemere Park and the terraces and Spring Lake Heights, we can look at as well, like different areas to kind of make it more natural scaped. So just send, send me an email or any one of us and we'll talk to you directly. I think it'd be a, a good way to go and do a site visit with you and see what you're, what you're really talking about. Yeah, as I saw Tim mentioned on the comments on the side that the acquisition of open space is really a, a town's responsibility. We don't really do that. We would do if there is open space and you need some sort of restoration or thing to that area, that's where we could come in and a plan or some or something like that. But we don't really acquire open spaces. Um, so again, but if it's something we could potentially maybe work with you guys, it would also would be um, where the Spring Lake Heights, I'm trying to think where that actual, uh, as part of Rec Pond, where Spring Lake Heights is like takes over. Um, cause I'm familiar with the Spring Lake side and Seeger, and then it's, uh, as you go up where it's actually Spring Lake Heights. But again, it's something that if there is open space and there needs to be invasive removal, we could look into that, but we don't actually acquire it. Yeah, I'd say it's a little bit west of the Jimmy Burns site. Yeah. Um, and then from Richard, what is the action plan and when? Um, we might need some clarification on that, Richard. The action plan for what, please? Yeah. <laughs> And Tim just added in the chat to us. So Tim Dillingham is our executive director. He's on not as a panelist, but as a um, attendee. So he's feeding us some information here that towns can also develop coastal public access plans that might identify ways to open up that access to the pond. Um, so Richard clarified opening the Spring Lake Heights Township, I guess, S-L-H-T-S to see the pond. Um, I guess if he's asking what would be the next steps for to actually go and see about opening up Spring Lake Heights. Um, I guess I'm not sure how to answer that uh, ourselves. Again, we deal more with the restoration. That might be something where you contact your township, contact Spring Lake Heights. Uh, there should be someone either, there should be an environmental commission or someone in the township that could, there's always like an open space person or something like that, that could maybe, you could start talking to them about it. 
And then um, go after the funding, go for it. Yeah, and then it would be a process of going after funding and things like that. But I think you would need to identify potential areas and that's maybe where someone with a township could help. Mm -hmm. uh, and then from there kind of move along. Yeah, and like Zach, you had mentioned, we're all about restoration. So yeah. we, we partner with many municipalities on these projects with open space grants. We don't do the acquisition of it, but we do the restoration of it. Um, mm -hmm. We can do, we coordinate volunteer events to do invasives if need be. Um, we've learned in the past, depending on the invasive species though, uh, in the beginning you get a lot of volunteers and it's hard work. So yeah. the third or fourth event, you might get three people show up when you first had a hundred. It's just because it's, it's hard work. So we're figuring out new ways to do that as well. Um, and Richard asked, are we in favor of um, that effort? And um, sort of as a blanket rule, the society uh, is in favor of public access to water uh, for all people. Um, I don't know uh, if we want to speak any more to that specifically, uh, but that's one of our sort of key uh, values at the society is, um, you know, we believe that everyone should have access to the coast. Um, and you know the water resources that that lead up to your literal area. So um, we certainly want folks to enjoy the nature around them. Um, so we've got some other questions coming in through the chat. Uh, can Spring Lake Heights DEP and the society partner with uh, residents of Shore Road to clean up the shoreline uh, that's beneficial to residents and wildlife? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we've talked in the past. The, unfortunately, this year, uh, you know, it hasn't been like previous others, and we've had a lot of our plans had to be put on hold. So we've talked to other people in the past about doing a shore cleanup and getting a bunch of volunteers out there to pick up some of the garbage or debris, and uh, we just haven't been able to do it because of what's going on. But that's definitely something that we would uh, be in favor of and we could work towards. And, and I, I, would, I would say for a cleanup, a really good model is the Shark River Cleanup Coalition. They do uh, cleanups of Shark River Inlet two to four times a year and organize it. And it's really been helpful. But um, So Arlene Sharapa of the SRCC would be the one to contact to get some ideas on how to organize that as well, or we can help organize that um, you know, moving forward. Yeah. Like I said, just email me. Um, and I did put Captain Al's um, email in the chat. So at different points, I think I added everybody's email to the chat. Um, but you should also have my email from your registration confirmation. So if you um, don't have Zach, Julie, or Captain Al's email, you can always shoot me an email and I'll get it uh, to the right place. Um, so and there and was forget, another. Don't forget the best way to help us do our restoration is become a member of the American Little Society. Um, your support really keeps us going, doing the work that we're doing, and I, I like the direction that the society is going. So thank you for all your support, too. Thank you, Al. Um, so a couple more questions that have come in. Um, there is somebody on who has a couple young boys, and they'd love to sample but can't access um, the pond or the watershed, really, uh, from where they live because of overgrowth. Um, can you say more? Um, I don't know, Julie, if you want to touch on that, you know, where they can go to help out and or should they just contact you? Certainly. Um, so where our access points are for the monitoring locations for the citizen science program all have fairly acceptable um, I understand what you're saying is um, the overgrowth as far as invasives and you, you'd like more access to the water. And that's, we've been touching on, um, it's, it's a big picture. Um, like we, we're happy to partner um, on those kinds of projects and be involved. Um, it just needs to be initiated with the township. Um, similar to the help we're doing at Edgemere Park, um, where we're, you know, giving our, um, it's not our initiative. Yeah, exactly. But we're happy to see it done and we, we'd love to see it done and we can we can help with our volunteer base to get help get it done. I guess it's just more, it's a township 
um, it needs to be initiated through that. But as far as access to the water itself, um, it's unfortunate right by your house, um, you're not capable of doing that too, due to invasives. Um, but all the monitoring locations, um, for the most part, throughout the water body are accessible. So it's, it's a, it is a challenge. Um, and invasives are very prevalent um, in, in the watershed. Um, through our water, um, our habitat assessments, you know, we've, we've identified lots of areas with um, further, you know, up into the streams we've seen invasives. Um, so it's, it's a prevalent issue and it's something that always, um, it needs attention. And we'd be happy to discuss, you know, how, what role we could play in that, but. Um, yeah, because it's we'd, also, you know. We'd love to get your guys out and sampling with yeah. us. Yep. And invasive removal, you know, you're, you're, depending where it's at, you're going to probably require some kind of permits for the removal and replanting of it uh, through the state. But I, I want to mention that sometimes the removal, you, you want to remove them properly because their root base may be really providing some stabilization. So you don't want to just rip them out and then the next thing everything erodes. So you want to, you would want us to come in and kind of look at it. And I, I would think, you know, maybe some kind of an invasive management plan would be needed just for maintenance of it until, you know, whatever you plant, whatever native species you plant get established. So it's usually like, I know for the maritime flor forest in Bradley Beach, we had Japanese knotweed and a lot of it. And I know Edgemere Park has Japanese knotweed, the honeysuckle, all kinds of stuff. Uh, it took us three years to eradicate that. And that was just cutting it. We learned that it, if we cut it, it puts all its energy into growing and takes it out of the roots. The roots eventually, it dies and the roots remain in that bank to keep that bank stabilized while the, the natives that landed are establishing. So that's, a, that's an important thing to think about. I wouldn't just go out and remove things. Yeah. Well, and that's why, you know, as Zach said, um, you know, you've got to involve the town, whether they have open space folks, environmental commission, you know, really getting a series of partners on board who have the knowledge and expertise to manage um, the appropriate and proper removal and stabilization of the shoreline and all of that, you know, is a really important process through which, um, and the Literal Society is happy to be a part of that, um, but it has to be initiated um, through those other entities. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, as I said, you know, everyone's email is in the chat, you know, or you've received emails from me uh, as part of your registration for this, you know, get in touch with us. Um, you know, we're happy to, to help point you in the right direction and then be involved, you know, on the back end of that. And so now that we're almost 30 minutes over, um, so great to see everybody, how excited folks are for this project. We've gotten lots of comments, um, how excited people are for the fish ladder. Um, as a, the non-science person on this, I also, I just think it's cool um, that we got to install that here in New Jersey. Um, so be on the lookout for those cameras we talked about, be on the lookout um, for other upcoming webinars and, you know, things from the Literal Society. There will be a recording of this available on our YouTube channel um, in the next couple of days uh, that you can share, share our videos. Um, as Al mentioned, we're a membership-based organization, so the best way for you to support us is to become a member. Uh, you can do that on our website, literalsociety.org. Um, you'll also be able to find um, other resources there. You can learn more about our other projects and initiatives um, and all the great work that these guys are doing. I'm seeing one more question come in. Um, Diane just wants to know how many folks were on the call today. At our peak, we were about 40 um, attendees plus our four, uh, the four of us panelists. We had over 65 people register, so I'm assuming that those other 25 folks are waiting for the recording that they, uh, since they missed the, the video um, or the live presentation. So hopefully we'll get um, more views. Uh, it's helpful for you to share this stuff with other folks to help really get the word out about the work that's happening um, in New Jersey. As Al said, we want this to be a, um, a demonstration, a pilot for other folks who want to do this in their communities, other uh, coastal watersheds. So, um, you know, getting the word out, super helpful to us. Any other closing thoughts? No, thanks for listening. <laughs> and let Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. All right, I'm going <laughs> to close it out then. All Thank right. you. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody.